Greetings, I'm Ki Lunyasha, also known as Pat Gallio. Um, I joined the Black Panther Party in 1969, uh, and that, uh, and that uh, energized me and motivated me to commit my life to uh, serving the people. Um, I've been an activist pretty much ever since. I had worked for the so-called War on Poverty, the government's uh, attempt to uh, create the so-called Great Society under Lyndon Johnson. It was really uh, an effort to uh, buy off uh, the uh, militants of the day. I was fired first and I went over their heads and, and because they had no reason to fire me. I was working overtime, as a matter of fact, on my own time and uh, going to meetings and meetings and meetings uh, because that's what we were doing in the day in protest against uh, real hunger and poverty uh, and all kinds of health problems, education problems, um, uh, uh, problems that poor people faced in that time uh, when there were no food stamps and uh, there was substandard housing. Homelessness hadn't happened yet, but there was substandard housing and so on. So um, when they decided on another way to get rid of those of us who were taking them at their word uh, and organizing. Um, they just chopped off the Community Action Institute to which I was attached and others and uh, absorbed who, whomever they chose uh, into the, uh, uh, the larger body, Community Progress Inc., uh, CPI, and I was out of a job. When I went down to the uh, welfare department to uh, get some assistance because I didn't qualify for unemployment insurance and I had a nine-year-old son at the time, uh, they offered me $25 a week. And I said, well, what am I supposed to do with this? Uh, so uh, in any event, I joined the Black Panther Party. Uh, I had been bumping heads with them all along in the community because they were organizing uh, and they were not getting paid. So at that time, the, the sisters in the party, we pulled our our AFDC checks, uh, those of us who were moms, that's assistance to families with dependent children that existed at the time. Clinton cleaned that up and threw that out in his welfare reform, which we call welfare deform. Once we uh, joined the Black Panther Party, then we really organized full time in the community and the chapter to which I was attached uh, at the, in the New Haven chapter was the second one uh, because the first chapter uh, um, Panthers had pretty much all been incarcerated uh, and uh, on, on a capital charge and the second chapter was organized fundamentally to get the first chapter out of jail and uh, in, you know, including um, uh, Field Lieutenant Erica Huggins and uh, the chairman of the party, um, Bobby Seale, who were facing um, the death penalty. So we had our work cut out for us, and um, that began uh, my, um, of course, Huey was already in jail, and so the, the Free, Free Huey was, campaign was in full swing as well. And then there was the, the uh, Vietnam War, uh, that we were all Panthers protested uh, vigorously and uh, so a lot of the rallies that we organized were anti-war rallies as well as free the Panthers rallies. Like Rochelle McGee once said, slavery 400 years ago, slavery today, it's the same but with a new name and the new slavery is prison. Um, uh, in addition to having uh, fostered the uh, or, or constructed the prison industries uh, that exist behind the walls where um, w uh, prisoners are contracted uh, labor for private big business. Um, they also do all of the work in maintaining the prisons and in fact they've even employed prisoners to build their own cells, build their own prisons, uh, um, uh, probably under the uh, Clinton's uh, prison boom uh, when he was in office, he um, subsidized, he told the states that they could build as many prisoners as they wanted, prisons as they chose, and, and he, the feds would sub subsidize them. So he, he was responsible for a huge prison boom. 
And now we have, we're seeing uh, the proliferation of private prisons. And that's, uh, whew, that's really ominous. Well, it actually uh, just changed slavery. It didn't end it. Uh, it allowed the states and, um, to incarcerate uh, people for the purpose of punishment. To, um, and, uh, of course, I'm a believer um, in rehabilitation, not punishment. And these prisons do not re rehabilitate at all. They, they really punish. And, uh, and the punishment is getting worse and worse. But uh, the main difference uh, between chattel slavery, in my opinion, and uh, today's uh, slavery, the prison farms of today, such as Angola uh, State Prison in Louisiana that was once a slave plantation and just was changed into uh, the new plantation, the prison. And uh, the conditions are the same. Exactly. They're, they're hor horrific conditions. So I think the main difference is that under chattel slavery, each individual was worth up to $10,000. So we were property, and therefore the slavers wanted to take good care of us because they wanted they valued their property, just as they would take good care of their cars or, or their houses. I don't, you know, and maybe they weren't cars <laughs> at that point, or their carriages. <laughs> In any event, they, they, um, we, we could have lots of children that gave them more slaves, so, um, and we could uh, um, have a house, a roof, you know, a shack, a log cabin, or whatever. Uh, we probably uh, grew our own food, so we probably ate organic, healthy food. Uh, they, they would call a doctor if we were ill and see that we had, uh, we were healthy, it behooved them for us to be healthy to work in the fields uh, and in their own homes uh, as servants. So they wanted us healthy. And, um, but now, in today's uh, new forms of slavery, we have uh, throwaways. People are throwaways and you can work them to death. In fact, when uh, slavery was reinstituted uh, uh, during the period of Reconstruction. Uh, the slave codes became black codes, and and blacks were criminalized for you know walking at night. There's a curfew, uh, loitering, uh, uh, traffic tickets, whatever, anything practically uh, was a crime. And uh, there were chain gangs that were extremely cruel and unusual. Uh, or not unusual in those days, but extremely cruel for sure. And um, so you, had a, a, um, you have a situation today where, in my, again, in my opinion, uh, whites are fast becoming, an, uh, or they're clear that they're a minority. Uh, for example, Dorothy um, Roberts uh, noted in her uh, recent book, um, Fatal Invention, how um, Big, how politics, uh, science, and big business recreate race in the 21st century. It's an excellent book. I highly recommend it. And uh, since we know uh, that the Gen Genome Project proved that there's one human race, um, the, uh, it did not erase racism. And white supremacism is still alive and well. And most of the 1% are white supremacists, no doubt. So, and they are controlling everything. So, as she pointed out in her book, uh, in speaking of New York City, the population, uh, you can pretty much divide it into um, uh, people of color and, she said, uh, which comprise, you know, Asians, Africans, Latin Americans, um, and, and Europeans, but she noted that whites are about 35%. And uh, I thought to myself, well, yeah. And then when I went to the, um, the yard of San Quentin, I was invited to speak um, with a, a, a young activist group um, that, whose name escapes me at the moment. Um, but in any case, um, I was on the yard and I was able to actually roll around and, and, and there were three groups uh, in the audience that, that you know, filled the yard. And they, uh, they were segregated, and there was 
there were pretty much an equal number of blacks, Latino, Latinos, and whites. And I, you could probably divide that group into thirds. And I thought, yeah, you know, um, I've long suspected that uh, we're no longer a minority, meaning people of color. And California has been um, a people of color state for a very long, majority state for a long time. But whites are loath to call themselves a minority, which means inferior in um, purpose or, or less than. So I said that to say this. The white supremacists are making every effort to reduce the population of blacks and, and browns and red and yellow, <laughs> if you want to go there. But, um, and uh, they're terrified of losing their whiteness. And so the prison system to, of today, the slave system of today, literally splits men and women. And to go back to what you asked me uh, about um, the difference from the 60s to today, in those days, the projects were the women's prisons, because men weren't allowed, pretty much. And so, uh, without going into detail, and, um, and it was mostly women on welfare who lived in the projects. But they've torn all the projects down now, and there's almost no subsidized housing left. And so the rate of incarceration of women has skyrocketed. So now you have women's prisons in California there's uh, Chowchilla that houses something like 5,000 women. It's one of the largest, if not the largest, prison in the country. So um, while the women still only comprise, comprise less than 10% of the entire prison population, it's, it's one of the fastest growing prison populations. It was extremely racist, um, no doubt, and, and, and blacks were being persecuted horrifically. The guards were really rednecks. I mean, they were very, very racist, mostly white. And um, so the prisons wanted uh, more more guards of color. They wanted, um, for a lot of good that did, but anyway, <laughs> but uh, it, it, it did cut down on some of the hostilities and, and, and um, uh, the tortures, uh, I think, but I'm not sure. It's, uh, no, it didn't really. <laughs> <laughs> but but uh, it's sad to say, but it hasn't, uh, they, because they've, they've built 60 supermax prisons now to torture us. Uh, but it's just the degree of, of torture, uh, or the style of torture. I mean, they had some horrible dungeons, like San Quentin's dungeon hole was literally a hole. They had a hole in the floor, you know, and it was nasty, it was filthy. You know, and the hole in the floor was for you to defecate uh, in, and it was, it was horrible. You know, um, well, those kinds of conditions don't exist now. You know, like Pelican Bay's um, uh, shoe, Pelican Bay State Prison now has a shoe that is windowless, high tech, and not they don't have bars. They have uh, doors with these little tiny holes that uh, that uh, you can't really see out of. Uh, they, and so a person is confined 24-7, uh, except if they're allowed to get go out to the yard, escorted by two guards. Uh, and that the yard is just a, a, a concrete 20-foot um, uh, high um, walled enclosure, outdoor enclosure. And they have plexiglass over the top, so you don't get much sky. So the bottom line is, and you get nothing to play with, and no, you know, no, not even a ball. So. Uh, and you're sent, you're put out there alone. In those days, the prisons were demanding the same thing prisoners are demanding today: better food. They wanted um, uh, uh, education. They wanted an opportunity to um, uh, to uh, for rehabilitation. To 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 uh, to um, like they used to have a, a Pell Grant in New York State. Okay. Uh, well, that came really behind Attica State Prison. Um, demanding, uh, you know, educational opportunity. Um, George Jackson um, organized a, 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 a work strike uh, in San Quentin, and he also organized a, a food strike. Everybody withhold your tray, you know, strike. 
and um, actually promote and managed to uh, have solidarity among the blacks and whites at the time and Latinos, you know. Uh, and it was very segregated at the time, of course, just as segregated as it is today. So not much has changed except uh, in those days, um, the, uh, the reporters could still get in and get interviews with prisoners. George Jackson was interviewed uh, a number of times. Um, but you can't, a journalist uh, can't get into the prisons today, and at least not in California. I don't know about other states. When George Jackson was assassinated uh, for, um, on the yard of San Quentin behind the constant brutalization and the murders that were going on behind the walls, they were just killing prisoners. Uh, um, following uh, August 21st, 1971, in September of 1971, Attica State Prisons uh, prisoners rose up and they had um, given a list of demands to the warden. Um, they wanted, um, you know, decent medical care, uh, decent food. Um, they wanted, um, you know, as I mentioned, educational opportunities, etc. You know, changed parole conditions and and um, and bilingual um, um, uh, classes and um, and and officers uh, for the Spanish-speaking uh, inmates and um, and on and on and um, of course you know they set up camp in the in in the, in the, the main yard and um, the long and the short of that was uh, Governor uh, Nelson Rockefeller at the time. Uh, just ordered the National Guard to move on them um, Vietnam style and and um, massacred um, 39 prisoners and guards right there and, and when all was said and done 43 prisoners and guards had been killed. So that sent a chill through the prison system and so you didn't hear too much from prisoners for a long time until more recently in California just uh, last year the, the Cal California um, uh, prisoners went on a strike, and uh, a hunger strike. And I've been on three hunger strikes myself, so I know what that's like. And one of them was to get out of a nasty medical prison, a, a, a nursing home, uh, as they, they, they euph euphemistically call those places. Um, but um, so I know what it's like to be on a hunger strike, and you don't go on a hunger strike arbitrarily. I also went on a hunger strike to uh, try to stop them from killing uh, Mumia Abu Jamal, and I, the, that was the longest one I went on. It was 16 days with only water. Okay, so I know what they went through, and one prisoner who carried it all the way died, and that ju news just came out within the last week or two. Uh, Chris Christopher Gonzalez, I, Christian Gonzalez, I think was his name. I hope I have it right. Because he's a martyr and we should honor him and we should find out more about him. Uh, because he he reminds me of Bobby Sands of the, the Irish struggle who uh, went on a, a hunger strike uh, as a member of the Irish Republican Army in their fight for independence from Britain. So uh, the, the tactics and strategies may change but we still have to fight and organize to abolish this horrible prison system. It's, there, as I mentioned earlier, there have been a proliferation, there's been a proliferation of, of these uh, supermax prisons. The, one of the latest ones is Florence, is in Florence, Colorado. and. And they're monsters. I mean, they really are. They're, they're high-tech monsters that isolate people and deprive them of, of everything human. Uh, there are no phone... Uh, one of my closest comrades and friends is Ugo Pinel, Yogi Bear, who um, was uh, among the six prisoners known as the San Quentin Six who were on trial in the 70s for the aftermath of the... Uh, of the uh, Incident that happened August 21st, and we and out of which came our our, our commemoration of Black August. Um, but Ugo Pinel has been in prison now for since he was 19 years old, and 
went in on a, what, a charge that should have gotten him a couple of years and, and he should have been out. Uh, but of course he got involved with um, uh, W.L. Nolan and George Jackson and Howard Toll and others who uh, were, were um, who discovered Mao and Fanon and Che and, um, and, and, and Lenin and Marx and, and became revolutionaries and were struggling to change the prison mentality, the criminal mentality, into a revolutionary mentality into so that when they came out they would be constructive contributors and defenders of their communities. And uh, another brother who's still in prison, a panther, uh, who uh, fought back with Sundiata Okoli, also known as Clark Squire, uh, if you wanted to write him, um, you'd have to use that name. But Sundiata, and he has a website, sundiataokoli.org, I think, or .com, but he uh, is 75 years old now, just turned 75. And he's been in, the last time he went to board, they, uh, they gave him uh, another 10. Prior to that, they gave him 20 years when he went to board. So they're not letting these guys out, and he's done well over th close to 40 years. Uh, Yogi, Hugo Pinel Yogi, has done uh, 47 years by now, and uh, most of that has been in solitary confinement. He's done 20 years in Pelican Bay Shoe, and that's, that's a, window, a windowless cell, no phone calls, visits, uh, that turn out to be less than an hour uh, by the time they put visitors through all their processing and um, only on holidays and weekends and it's um, 800 miles from where his family lives in San Francisco and uh, most of the prisoners in Pelican Bay Shoe are from LA and that's I I, it's all the way at the other end the northwest corner on the Oregon border so uh, however many miles it is it's, it's far <laughs> and um, so they have them very isolated and, 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 um, and being tortured uh, with sensory, sensory deprivation and, and isolation. And uh, they're not allowed, they're only allowed a, a very small amount of materials, possessions, including books and magazines, and, and much of them, almost everything that goes in their cells is censored. And the only way they get out is to debrief or, or snitch or die. Political prisoners are are considered domestic terrorists, and that should answer your question right away. They're not going anywhere, you know. Um, Mumia Abu Jamal is everyone knows if they've studied this, his case at all that he did 30 years on death row uh, for a crime he didn't commit, and now he's in general population thanks to an international movement uh, led by. Pam Africa and, and, and many, many others, um, the, that he sees in general population, but now the fight has just begun to get him out, out of prison altogether, uh, but it's very likely that if, you know, they, they're going to throw away the key on him if they can, if we let them. And the same thing holds true, I mean, what, what country in the world besides the United States incarcerates juveniles for life without the possibility of parole. None other. Not one. There are very nearly 300,000 prisoners doing life, what we call lua, life without the possibility of parole in, in prisons nationwide who were incarcerated as juveniles and you hear more and more every time you turn on the news he's being tried as an adult she's being tried as an adult I beg your pardon an adult is an adult is an adult a child is a child is a child so we're incarcerating children and uh, which brings me to the whole as 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 um, um, Mar Mar I think her name is uh, Marion Edelman Marion Wright Edelman who uh, noted uh, the cradle to prison pipeline okay so now you have a situation where the school systems are so horrendous and so are being devastated and the rise and proliferation of uh, charter schools and, and which is really indicative of the privatization of the school system so public schools have become 
the uh, the minimum minimum security prisons out here in many of the um, the the ghettos across this country, and uh, children are so neglected and so impoverished in today's world that you have tens of thousands of children, if not millions of children, nationwide who who are homeless. And uh, the, even the public school systems are starting to recognize that, that they have to accommodate homeless children and they're sending buses to certain shelters and stuff to pick up children. This is, this is insane that the way that pop, uh, people who are poor are being criminalized and as the middle class drops out into poverty, they're discovering just how nasty this system really is. And that's one of the reasons I think you see the Occupy movement spreading like wildfire across this country because you have people who have never been uh, without a job or without a house or a home being you know, uh, foreclosed upon, who have been, lost their jobs and are, are becoming destitute. And once they're out there in the street, I mean, they, they just, okay, let's, um, Go back to one of the earlier questions. We talked about the black codes. Okay, well, those codes were had to do with loitering and 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 walking at night. You know, curfews against being out at night and that kind of type of thing. Any excuse being net, better than none to put you in the slave system. Okay, so nowadays, homelessness makes you automatically a candidate for prison for jail. Because here in San Francisco, they just passed a sit-lie law, which means you can't sit down and you can't lie down in a park. You can't sit down on a bench or sit down on the curb. So, and if you get, uh, and you're, they're constantly being harassed and cited uh, and, and thrown into jail for the, these, these ridiculous laws that they're passing that uh, allow them to just throw you in jail. And let's, let's remember also that the cost of prison uh, if it, we've talked about uh, some of, a little bit of we've touched on the slave labor because they make everything under the sun that you can think of, and all the corporations, WalMarts, Microsoft, Nordstroms, you, you know, you, the defense industry, all of them, they're all contracting prison labor. Um, and if they're not doing that, each prisoner who goes to jail or prison, is worth at least in California forty nine thousand dollars per head. Okay, so they want those bodies. That's forty nine thousand dollars. Think about that. That's enough money to send somebody through Harvard, right? So you have, um, and where does that money go? It certainly is not providing healthy food for the prisoners and and really nice cells and stuff. You know, they're piled on the top, top of each other in these huge dormitories and gyms, uh, triple bunks, triple decker bunks, bed to bed. Just horrible. I'm sure some of you have seen the scenes. And they're just horrific. Imagine living in, in, in such a crowded space. Uh, but it, they're making tons of money. And the highest paid state employee of California was the lieutenant gov no, not, the, not the lieutenant governor, the lieutenant guard uh, in the California prison uh, union that they have the nerve to have peace officers or something like that in the title of their union. But um, he, he made more than um, Arnold Schwarzenegger at the time. I think it was 2007. And uh, a couple of over a hundred, two hundred thousand dollars that year, and lots of prison guards in California make as much as a hundred thousand dollars a year on a regular basis with overtime, and these are guys with no education. With with, I, I think they have to have a high school diploma, but nothing more than that. So um, you have everybody's hands and fingers in the pie, and uh, now uh, there's a, a new problem in. It's, it's proliferating all over the country. And uh, Human Rights Watch did a, just did a, uh, a piece on the aging of the prison population. And of course, the baby boomers are, are, are becoming elderly. And the, the number of prisoners, elder prisoners, has 
has increased at something like the rate of 65% compared to about 17% of the general population. So uh, prisoners past the age of uh, uh, 65. So it's, it's really getting nastier and nastier. And listen, I've been in the, the, the medical prisons uh, between 1975 and 1980, I spent a total of three years, not all consecutive, uh, of, uh, in, in their nasty nursing homes. Uh, they, they made me much worse than I would have been, and if I had money, I probably would have recovered. But um, they, uh, they warehouse you and, and just treat you like crap. And, um, and, and you're, I've been in dormitories, in bed-to-bed -bed dormitories uh, for elderly, and, and you're, the conditions are horrible. So I can't even imagine being disabled in prison, behind prison walls, if they treat you so badly and you're not even a quote-unquote criminal. And by the way, speaking of criminals, before we run out of time, I just have to say that the real criminals are on Capitol Hill and on Wall Street. And we have to recognize that. These murderers, extortioners, um, 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 robbers, I talk about robber barons. I mean, <laughs> they, they look like nice guys compared to these dogs today. I mean, these greedy guts, they're, they're horrible. So, and we all know that, but yet we still tolerate this. And there um, are approximately, there were well over 3,000 people on death row ready to be executed when they know damn well that they, the, um, the, the system of uh, the death penalty system is completely flawed and very, very racist. And uh, the governor uh, of uh, Chicago, not that long, Illinois, not that long ago, uh, released some 160 prisoners from death row and just emptied the death row because there had been so many exonerations once the DNA uh, method became available. So, uh, of finding out uh, who the real culprits were. So, the bottom line is we have a, a criminal system that is growing worse by the day, a system of enslavement and torture, and uh, we don't even have time to get into the torture that goes on behind those walls. What's it like for people once they actually get parole and they, right. they, they get outside? I mean, Right, they're completely disenfranchised. Uh, it's hard enough to get a job out here if you've got a clean record of experience in today's uh, high unemployment uh, period. Uh, uh, so uh, to, you know, uh, there have been, uh, you know, uh, there's groups called, like I, All of Us and None, who are fighting for um, the elimination of the box, you know, checking the box of the, at the applications asking whether or not you've ever been arrested or incarcerated. And um, so, because what's happening is no matter what you've, you've done, if you smoked a joint and got caught and did time for, for smoking marijuana, for goodness sakes, um, and that's the other thing, the war on drugs is, 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 is one of the main reasons we have so many prisons. It's really a war on the people. It's plain and simple, just as we see it escalating in Mexico, where they're just wiping people out with it. You know, we, they know what they're doing. They're just wiping people out. They don't need people anymore, and they need cheap, cheap labor. So um, the bottom line is to be as greedy as they are. <laughs> but um, bring me back, Hans. <laughs> um, about what people face um, when they um, come out and they're, and they're on parole right, and how right, difficult right. it is yeah, to stay can, out of oh, prison. Oh, subsidized housing. I live in subsidized housing, the project. And uh, they can't get in here. They can't, they can't get subsidized housing. They don't qualify. So the very people who need it the most when they first come out of prison and they're let come out of prison with $200 in their pockets, you know, gate money, in a city, the, the most expensive city in the country, they can't leave the city because they're on parole. So they have to stay in the most expensive city, uh, and their two hundred dollars is gone before the week is out. Even the single occupancy, uh, single room occupancy SROs, hotels, the cheap flea bag hotels, charge an arm and a leg. For for they're very expensive to, to live with bed bugs and rats and roaches. So they're they're in a dire situations. I have a a, a, a young uh, man that I've grew up right here in this in the projects down the street, a young black man, I call my son, and 
I think he's been out of prison, in and out of prison close to 40 times since he, he's almost 40 years old now and, and uh, you know, I've known him since he was about nine years old and uh, he started off in juvenile and, and, and then right in and out, in and out, in and out because, I mean, the last time, because they get stopped and frisked all the time and if they're on parole, they're just perfect candidates to go back. Or if they miss a parole officer's appointment, that's a violation. And the other thing is that they have no civil rights whatsoever when they come out. So that if, no matter where they're staying, if they have an address, the police can raid that address any day of the week, any time of night. They don't have to have a warrant or anything to search you, to, to, to bust in on you or anything. And if um, whatever you, you might be doing, if, not to their liking, back to jail you go. Okay, so here we have a situation where you can rob a whole country, you know, uh, you can uh, rob people out of their houses, right, uh, and, take, uh, and take all their property and, and, and you won't do any time. But uh, in California where they have a street free, free strikes law, uh, you can steal a piece of pizza and it's your third strike and you will be faced 25 to life. So it, it's, a, situ it, it's a, a system that uh, is a war on the people, poor people, um, and it's a, a slave system, and it's a system that is so racist that it, is, it has taken away the reproductive years of men and women so that the po they will literally reduce the population. So it's, again, an, a system, and also it's a, a system of repression because they've got plenty of prisons waiting for anybody, and concentration camps, really, waiting for anybody who resists. And we see arrests going across this country all the time, people getting busted left and right, and some of those people may get out, the ones who have some folks with money and lawyers will get out. The folks who don't have money and lawyers will not get out. And once they're in there and they're shown to be resistors, they won't begin. They will be staying there a long time. So the bottom line is we have to fight. And like George Jackson once said, we can fight in here, but in here we fight and we die. We can't win unless we have the support of the people. And that's what we have to do. We, uh, and just as we abolished the, the slave system with the cry, abolish slavery, we need to abolish the prison system, which is the new slavery. So it's about abolition of the prison system, and I think we all need to become prison abolitionists as well as, well as death penalty abolitionists. I've written uh, a paper called Slavery on the New P Plantation and uh, American Torture Chambers that can be found uh, 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 you know, either by emailing me or, or I think Jenny has them available, Virginia Lee, <laughs> who <laughs> has solicited this video. And um, so they're available to you for more information and uh, some updates that I've done. Thank you, Hans Bennett, for, the, for doing this. Uh, uh, videotape and uh, I hope that uh, the class at the University of Wisconsin uh, will move forward uh, in uh, oh and by the way one more quick thing uh, Ginny asked a question about the criminal studying criminal justice uh, I think you should study criminal injustice and not take courses in how to repress and incarcerate people Thank you very much.